You may be seated. What a powerful time of worship. Amen. Wow, 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 wow. I'm so blessed to be here today. Uh, it's so nice that I get to spend so much time with the Scarborough family. So thank you for always welcoming me. Whether you're joining us for the first time or a couple of weeks, if you're new with us today, I want you to know that we want to get to know you, that we want to connect with you, and we have a, something called a connect card. Say connect card. connect card. Connect card where you can type in your information, and we want to just have a conversation with you, get to know how, we, how you liked it, how we can serve you better, pray with you, pray with anything that you, for anything that you need, but we want to know that you are family here. And that, you know, if you come here at Champion Life Center, that you're not just a number, but we do really want to get to know you. So if you're joining us also online, the same thing. Fill out a Connect card and we'll connect with you. So turn to your neighbor and say, it's so nice to see you at home, right, that it's, it's, it's so nice to virtually see you. Let us know where you're tuning in from. <laughs> it's nice to see you. Man, remember a while ago when we couldn't see each other? Let's just take a moment and think back when we couldn't see each other. Let's not take for granted being able to meet with one another. It's so amazing. Are you ready to hear the word of God today? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your presence. God, your sweet presence that's in our midst today. We just make room for you even right now. Lord, that you would just speak to us, that you would touch us, that, Lord, that you'd continue the work that you've already been doing through worship and that, Lord, that, that today as we study your word, that it would become alive. That it wouldn't just be text or, or, or things, but it would come alive in our lives. That we would know how to apply it. That you would breathe life into our situations. That, Lord, in this season, that you would have a word for us for such a time as now. We praise you, and I pray that, Lord, I decrease, you increase. That, Lord, every word that is spoken be straight from you. We bless you, Father. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. I do want to mention that I do have my daughter here with me today. So I know a lot of you say, where's your kids? Where's your kids? My daughter is here somewhere. I don't know where she is, but she's very high energy. So, you know, I can't keep her in one place. So she might be everywhere. But she's here. And so if you want to say hi to her, she would love to say hi to you. Um, but over the past couple of months, as I've been studying and, and talking to the Lord, there's been something that he's been echoing over me over the seasons, over every season. And there is no doubt that we've been facing tremendous trials, right? All of us can look back at the past year, maybe in the past couple of months, uh, past couple of weeks, and know that we are facing unforeseen circumstances, tremendous trials, unknown hardships that are now uh, in our lives. And many of these things are out of our control. Real lows, real moments where we struggle with our faith. We have questions, questions about God, questions about uh, what we believe and what we believe, why we believe and what we believe. And whether we like it or not, life continues to change, right? Always changing around us. Seasons, relationships, situations just keep on changing. And I find that more than ever, that everything in life is changing. And if you're like me, you know that in change, sometimes it's difficult to, to, to keep track of what's impo important, to, to not lose sight of what's important. And through the, the various seasons of change in my life through the past couple of months, I would feel the Lord impress on me the word that we're studying today. Let's turn our Bibles to John 15. John 15, 1 to 5. It says this, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. God bless his word. And so over 
the, the past seasons of my life, the Lord would impress this text to me, and he would echo the word remain. Remain. Remain in me as I remain in you. And I would hear it so clearly as everything in my life was changing. As I didn't know what was happening. That he would say, remain, remain, remain. That, that with everything changing, don't change your commitment to me. Remain in me. Say that, remain. remain. Type that in the chat if you're joining with us. Remain. We need to remain in Jesus. And the word remain, it's an active verb. It means, in the original language, it means mino, which is to stay. In other translations, abide, to remain. And it's a verb that's active. It's not passive, because to remain, to stay, to abide in anything, relationships, you know, our workplace, anything in life, it takes effort. It requires our time and energy. It's not passive for two reasons. And the first is this, to remain anywhere in life, to remain, to stay, to abide in anything life, in, in anything in life, you must always be fighting the temptation to leave. It's holding your ground right here, deciding to stay right here and not entertaining the many options that are around. That you wouldn't leave where you are because of discomfort or hardship, that it's convenient somewhere else, but you would remain. And if in my relationship with my wife, how many know in marriage that remaining in relationship with your spouse, it, you, you have to be intentional and active on not entertaining the other things around you. You have to remain in relationship. And it's difficult. It's difficult to remain, to stay, to abide. Because we live in a world where there are so many options, right? So many options that are accessible to us in a culture that tells us that it's all about me. So what happens is, is that remaining faithful becomes very difficult. You're not happy with your job? Change it. You know, after the pandemic, I think even all the more, job hopping has become more normal, right? You stay with a company, probably not for as long as you would have in the past because of flexibility or whatever it may be. But if you want a new job, change it. You know, if, if you want a new home, move. How many in the past year have moved to a new place? Relocated, uh, bought a new home, moved, changed locations. If you're not happy with your friends, ditch them. Right? If you don't agree with your friends, I'm going to go online and I'll find friends who believe what I believe. You can do that now. You can find anything online. You can find a community online that, that agrees with everything that you believe in. I, could, I can go online and, and look for a kite flying club <laughs> and find it. Because that's... With the, what, what, with the options that we have. Not happy with your spouse? Nobody here say amen. Don't say amen. Don't change your spouse, okay? But the reality is, is that year after year, divorce in Canada has increased. The number of people getting divorces has increased. About, in Canada alone, it's about 2.7 million. 2021. If you're not happy with your church, now you can just click a different link. <laughs> right? You could be watching me right now. You, I don't like what this guy's saying. Close the browser. Click a different link. Click something else. You can leave the church. There's so many options. You see, remaining faithful, staying, abiding, it takes effort. I need to constantly be fighting the temptation to leave where I am planted right now. That's the first thing. The second thing is to remain as active because you must be present where you are. You know, you don't stay in a place because there's nowhere else to go. When you decide to be there, you are there. All your energy is where you decide to stay. Whether it's your workplace, your relationship. If you decide to stay there, you're giving everything to where you are. 
despite the other things, you're choosing to be present. You see, remaining, remaining, it's challenging. It's, it's, it's difficult. And in John 15, Jesus says what? Remain in me. So simple, but so much required from us. There will be other options that pull you out of relationship with Jesus. Where we have to decide to stand our ground and stay in relationship with him. Not flee, but fight for our relationship. There will be things in life that make us busy, that cause us to be less present in our relationship with Christ. That's how it happens. Slowly, you start to drift away from relationship. All of a sudden, you look back, you say, whoa, 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 I'm so far from Jesus. Because the busyness of life, you know, work, school, friends, family, work, 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 friends, family, whatever it may be, sometimes, you know, they take our attention away from being present with the Lord right now. You could be faithfully coming to church. Thank God you do. Faithfully coming to church, but still not in a relationship with Jesus. He doesn't say remain in the building. He doesn't say remain in CLC. He says remain in me. The pandemic, we're going to keep, we always talk about the pandemic because it was so interesting. As the pandemic happened, many churches closed. What we found is that a lot of people fell away from their faith. And it's so interesting because we're finding now that people were remaining in traditions, remaining in the building, remaining in those things rather than remaining in Jesus. When the building closed, all of a sudden, the religion, the Christianity ended for them. You see, Jesus shook it up. He said, all the traditions, all the things that you're used to, I'm going to shake it up so you can remain in me. Are we actively remaining in Jesus? I want to ask you a question that you know the answer right now. You don't need to think about it. Are you in love with Jesus? Are you in love? You know when you're in love. I think all of us here know when we're in love. You don't need to think about it. You don't need to ponder it. It's a yes or no in this moment. What is your heart telling you? Are you in relationship with Jesus? Because there's a call right now to remain in him. It was a tough year. It was a tough year. Don't give up on the Lord. Don't give up on your relationship. Don't get too busy for him. Remain, 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 remain. What we're chasing in life, all of us, what we want actively in our life, the good things, only Jesus can fill that void in our life for us. I want to tell you that the grass is not greener on the other side of relationship with Jesus. The grass isn't greener. It's not greener on the other side of relationship with Jesus. So we must remain in him. And today I want to spend most of my time to equip us with three truths that would help us to align ourselves. Because it's hard to do this. That we can always look at these truths to say, this is why I'm remaining. This is why I'm choosing to fight. This is why I'm going to stay in this relationship. Three truths that we can encourage ourselves daily. So that when it's it, it, other things are pulling our attention, we can say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. This is the truth. Say three truths. The first is this. Jesus, he's the only source of life. In John 15, Jesus compares himself to a grapevine, giving life to the branches it possesses, causing them to bear fruit, to bear life. And he opens up with a bold statement saying this, John 15, 1, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. Not, you don't feel like it's that bold, right? But it is. He says, I am the true vine. Fine. And it's interesting that Jesus includes the word true. It's interesting that he intentionally says that he's the true vine. The, the fact that he purposefully indicated that he's the legitimate 
vine tells us what? It highlights that there are illegitimate vines. That there are illegitimate sources of life. Because whenever there is something stated to be true, there is always something found to be false. And Jesus distinguishes himself and says, hey, I am the true vine. I am the true source of life. We need to remain in him because he is the true source. He is the only source. And we can't be naive to think there aren't other sources who are trying to get our attention, trying to get us to connect to them. But they're not the true source. Only Jesus is. And I think this is such an important truth to emphasize. Because we live in a time today where people connect themselves to many different things. Illegitimate vines. Searching for what only Jesus can give. Which is fulfillment, life, love, joy. They're searching. They want to fill a void. In the Pew Research Center, they did a study in 2019 before the pandemic. And the study essentially said this, this was the results, that there was a decline in the people who identified themselves as Christian and an increase of those who identified as agnostic, atheist, or nothing in particular, who believed in nothing in particular. So they call them the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, and it's about a quarter of the, per- the population, 26%. And I find this interesting because in the research, we're seeing more people say no to Jesus but saying yes to other things. And it tells us that there are people who are searching, but they're not searching in the right place. That they're saying no to Jesus and other things. And I don't know about you, but when you share Christ nowadays, you share your faith. You talk to someone and say, you know, tell them about your faith and all that stuff. And I find more often than not now in our time, this is what they say. They say, yeah, Paul, Like, I'm spiritual too. Like, have you heard that? Where they say, I'm spiritual too. We're the same. I I believe in the universe. I believe in uh, a different religion, but it's, they're all the same God, right? Like, they're all the same. They're all the same God. I I do the practice. I'm spiritual. I do uh, palm reading or meditation. I, I, I do, I practice yoga, deep breathing, reflection. I'm spiritual. I follow uh, this prophet or this religious leader what do they say and all these people are 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 attaching themselves to other things searching for life searching for fulfillment searching for joy but what is it that they're missing church what are they missing not a trick question they're missing jesus you see they don't have the true vine that bears eternal fruit What they practice will bear temporary fruit, fruit that doesn't last. What the 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 practices, the things that they're doing, the 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 deep breathing, the meditation, all those different things, they won't love you like Jesus does. They won't secure you like Jesus does. They won't free you from sin like Jesus does. They won't impart peace to you like Jesus does. You see, even the spiritual leaders that you believe in. The, the other gods that you claim to be God, the, all those things, they will either die or are dead. They're not going to give you full life. You're looking to them for life when they're going to pass away. Let me tell you about my Jesus, the true vine, the true source, who has overcome death with life. He's living today, the right hand of the Father. And I don't know about you, but if I'm looking for life, I'm going to put it and put my trust in in the one who has mastered it. Who is the one that that death couldn't overcome him. That he has an all life. That he's the only one who can give eternal life. That there's a paradise after here that I can walk into because of him. The one who gives peace, love, joy, hope eternally. That surpasses all of our understanding, not dependent on situation. So when these people say that 
hey, I'm spiritual too. I say, well, you don't have Jesus. He is the true vine. He is the only source of life. 1 John 5, 12, whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. Say, I want a full life. Type that in the chat, I want a full life. Jesus is the only one who can give us a full life. Why? He's the only one who can give us a life of purpose. Where the creator himself can give us what we are intended to do here on earth. He gives us purpose that he's designed us and and created us for purpose. You will never be as satisfied as when you are doing what you are made to be doing. And only Jesus can give you that purpose. We live a life full of hope. We have eternal hope. Thank God that what we're experiencing right now, the troubles of this world, are temporary. That there's a life after this life. And I have full hope because of Jesus. And he's the only one who can offer me eternal life. In fact, if we don't believe in him, we go where? To hell. In fact, Jesus is the only way to paradise. He is the way, the truth, and the life. It's only through him that we can live a life full of hope. It's only through him we can live a life with no sin. Where we don't have to walk around not whole, broken. Where we don't have to walk in bondage, carrying the weight of our sin. Only he can take our sins away from us. Free us from sin. Make us whole. Restore us from the inside out. Only Jesus can do that. And only through him we can live a life full of eternal fruit. Fruit that doesn't spoil after each season. Fruit that's constant. Not dependent on my situation, but fruit that's always present. In our passage, Jesus says this, that he's the only one who causes us to bear fruit in our lives. Let's look at it. John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You see, fruit is not possessions. It's not even what's seen because everything that's seen will pass away. And what's the difference between earthly fruit and eternal fruit? You see, earthly fruit is all the fruit that I've mustered up from my own strength. From my own doing. And the problem with earthly fruit is when I have no strength, I don't got no fruit. When I am in trouble, when I am at my lowest point, I don't have anything. But you see, eternal fruit, that's based on God. And even when I'm feeling low, even when I don't have the strength inside of me, I still have joy. I still have peace. I still have love. I still have fruit because it's not from me. It's from him. Has anyone here played the game Choose? Anybody here? Nobody here. Okay, so there's a game called Choose. And I'm sure you, once I say it to you, you'll be like, yeah, I play that game. So it's, a, it's like an icebreaker game or a game where you, you do to kill time. And it's a game, essentially, you put two options in front of someone. And they have to choose. Pretty simple, right? So people would always do like either two amazing things and you'd have to choose or they they pretty much always do like always horrible things and you have to choose between the horrible things and in our nature we always like put up the horrible things right because we're like oh we want to see what you choose it would be like you know choose or would you rather have body odor all the time and not smell it or smell everyone else's body odor all the time. It's one of those, and you would choose, and everyone would be, ha, 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 ha. That's so funny. And I'm kidding you. I'm not kidding you. When, when I was reading about this and studying this, I was playing this game with the Lord because I was looking at earthly fruit and eternal fruit. And let's, let's be honest here. We want earthly fruit, right? We do want a nice house. We want, I don't know about you. I want a nice car. 
I want to, I want to be prosperous. You see, that's a good thing. And we, but there's also eternal fruit. So I'd be with God and, and we'd be like, okay. And I'd say, okay, God, what do I want? Let's play. And I'd be like, okay, I want, I want a big house. Uh, I want to be comfortable. I want a place where my kids can all have their own room and, you know, we can enjoy time together, family time, not worry about these things. Good thing. Er earthly fruit. So then I was like, okay, let's put it up against eternal fruit. And then so I said, versus peace. And I was like, no brainer. I'm going to choose peace. If I can have peace that surpasses all understanding, I'm giving up that house every day. I say, okay, round two. I want influence in my career. I want to climb the corporate ladder. I want to be able to, you know, show that I've done something. Be promoted, have recognition. Uh, I want that. I'll put it up against joy. And I think to myself again, man, I would choose joy. I would always choose joy. Because how many know that life is hard? And there are really low lows. If I could have joy through for my whole life, I would give anything for it. You see, earthly fruit versus eternal fruit. And it, it seems so simple to choose. Yet some of us are still connecting ourselves to the wrong vine, producing the wrong fruit. It's simple to choose. Some of us are still connecting to the wrong vines, producing the wrong fruit. Only Jesus can cause you to bear eternal fruit. When you connect to him, it's when you can bear eternal fruit. And we see some of these fruit when they're illustrating the fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5. Let's turn there, 5, 22 to 24. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. You see, if I could have any one of those, look at that list. If we could have any one of those all the time, what a life we would live. I want the real fruit. Say that. I want the real fruit. I'm not talking about bubble tea, by the way. I want the real fruit. I want it. Who wants it? I want it. How? Only through Jesus. He is the only source of life. The Bible even says, we just read that, that apart from him, we can do nothing. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to share a personal thing. I was reading this. Um, I was reading this passage, and I came to this verse. It says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And, and I was offended with God. I said, what do you mean, God? What do you mean I can't do anything? I can do nothing without you. And in my pride, you know, start to list off the things, right? God, you know, I can build, a, I, I build my family. I can provide. I, I, I can go on a trip. I can have a house. I can do all these things. And then, then, then I went a step further. And I was like, look at the other people out there. Look at the successful people who don't know you. They're successful. You're saying apart from me, we can do nothing? But God, look. And as a side note, how many know it's okay to come to God with your questions? Right? It's okay to wrestle with God. It's okay to read something and not just say, huh, I don't agree with that, but you know, okay. It's okay because when you're in a relationship with someone, you're, you're all in. You, you can ask these questions. We don't, in relationship, we don't get the wedding day version of your spouse all the time, right? Right? We don't. You get the, the every day, the, the attitudes, the habits, the, all the stuff version of your spouse. It's the same with the Lord. When we come, we can't, we can't pretend to be perfect. And anyways, I was wrestling with him, be like, God, what do you mean? What do you mean I can do nothing? Look it, look around me. And the Lord rebuked me like he does, right? But very gently. And, and his, his gentle rebuke is just, it hits even more. 
And he, and he, would, he, would, he would speak to me. And he, he would say to me, I look at my list, and he says, what is it that you have done on your own that will not pass away? And I, and I began to look at my list. And I, I couldn't find anything. And I looked down, and, and I found that everything that I have done on my own will pass away. That all the accomplishments, everything that I have, it's not going to be brought with me when I die. But when I pass away, it passes away. And without him, we can do nothing of eternal value. We can, do no, we can accomplish nothing in life that reaps eternal benefit. For here in our life after, we got to start talking about life as a full life, right? Not just life on earth, but my life is here in all of eternity. But, but we can't do anything of eternal value without Jesus, without the giver of life. It can only be done through him. And I was in that moment where I was like, man, just humbled. And in that moment, he whispered and he spoke to me and said, so remain in me. Remain in me. Remain in me. You see, Jesus is the true vine. Apart from him, we can do nothing. In him, we bear what matters. So I encourage you, remain, 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 remain. Encourage yourself. Remind yourself when you're tempted, to, when you're we're too busy, encourage yourself that everything that I'm chasing can be found right here in my relationship with Jesus. The question, what is your source right now? What are you trying to find in life? What are you chasing? What what vine are you connected to? And are you connected to the true vine? Because we're all here today saying, I want the real thing. I want a full life. So the challenge is, is to remain in relationship with Jesus. Don't let distractions of life pull you away from the only source of life. What you're desiring is found in relationship with Jesus. Turn to your neighbor, say remain. remain. Turn to your other neighbor, say remain. remain. The second truth, this is a truth I get excited about, to why we should remain in relationship with Jesus is that he is making us fruitful. John 15, 1 to 2, let's turn there. I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. As we remain in Jesus, the true vine, it says that every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Why? So that it will be more fruitful. He says every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Why? So that it would be more fruitful. He says... Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Why? So it would be more fruitful. Someone say, ouch. Type that in the chat, ouch. He makes us fruitful how? By pruning. You see, he prunes us for our benefit. He works on us, for us, so that we can bear fruit and experience it in our lives to experience more good things. When we stay, when we remain in him, he's able to cut off the bad things in us, to, to cut off the things that would allow us to bear more life and more fruit. And in John 15, our key passage, Jesus uses the analogy of a grapevine. And I wanna ask, are there any grape farmers out here me neither. Yeah, I don't know any grape farmers. Uh, but if you're a gardener, any gardeners, if you're a gardener, you know the importance of pruning. Pruning removes the dead so that the energy is focused on what lives. So you can bear more fruit. And because Jesus 
brought up the illustration of a grapevine. I've been studying about grapes all week. So next year, this time, I will be coming to communion with full grapes. <laughs> Just kidding. Don't hold me to that. But I was learning about the grapevine. And University of Minnesota, they released an article. And the article was on growing grapes in the home garden. And I was looking at it, and it teaches people how to grow grapes and the importance of things. What I found interesting is this. It said, new grape growers are often surprised about how much of the vine gets removed during pruning. In an average vineyard, 80 to 90% of the new growth is pruned off each winter. Heavy pruning provides the best fruit. Light pruning results in large yields of poor quality fruit. And I'm here studying about grapes, reading and studying about grapes, and I find this, and I think to myself, wow, Lord, that's what you are doing in my life. I think about the seasons of stretching. I think about the seasons where my character gets tested, the hard things. I think about uh, times where there's real pain, real heartbreak. I think about times where I felt the Lord cut off relationships in my life, cut off attitudes, cut off bad habits, closed doors of opportunities that I felt were for me. And I think to myself, heavy pruning produces the best fruit. And I remember there's purpose in the pruning. That in the moments where I feel the fire, in the moments where I don't feel the most spiritual, in the moments where I don't feel the goosebumps or the butterflies, in the moments where I feel like I'm in my off season, the dry and desolate, that I can be encouraged because God is working in me for me, that he's pruning me so I can bear the best fruit. And I want to encourage someone today, if you are going through the hardest part of your life, if you're going through the season right now where, where you're struggling, where you don't know what's going to happen, where you don't feel the Lord, I want to encourage you like we are seeing today, even when we don't see it, he's working. Even when we don't feel it, he's working. <laughs> remain, remain, remain. God is working on you. He's working on you. He's making you fruitful. And the harder the pruning, the better the fruit. If you're in your hardest season, if you're in your hardest season right now, praise God. Because you're going to be yielding some of the best fruit you've ever tasted in your life. But we need to remain. Don't fall away from the Lord in your season of pruning. Don't give up on God when it gets hard. You see, we can't be bitter to God when he disciplines us because he's changing us. Thank God he prunes us. Thank God he's working on us, making us better. Thank God that we have a gardener who, who comes in and prunes out of love and care. And I'm sure there's people here in this room. I'm sure there's people here in this room who can say, thank God he pruned me. Thank God he dealt with my anger. Thank God he dealt with my insecurities. Thank God he dealt with my complacency, my attitude. Thank God he closed that door for me. Thank God that relationship cut off. Thank God that he exposed that sin in my life. Thank God. Is there anyone here who can testify who's standing in their season of fruitfulness and can look back and say, man, that was hard, but thank God because today I'm standing in some of the best fruit that I've ever tasted. You see, if you're here today and you're saying, I want the fruit, I want it. The question is, are you willing to be pruned? And will you remain through it all? Friends, we need to embrace the pruning. It should be one of the reasons that draws us into relationship. Because I don't want this fruit today to be the best fruit that I taste in life. I don't want this version of me to be the best version of me. 
I want to be more like Christ. I want to go from glory to glory. I want to experience his fullness, the fullness of life. So we're challenged to welcome discipline. We're challenged to welcome hardship, knowing that it's the Father who's at work. Hebrews 12, 9 to 11, let's look at this. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. The word says no discipline seems pleasant, but painful. But later on, say later on, say later on, it produces a harvest. We need to work out our lives. We need to change. We need to want to change. We need to prune off the bad attitudes, the bad habits. We need to prune off the false beliefs. We need to work on our lives. We're called to work out our salvation. Philippians 2, 12 to 13. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now more than in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 to 24. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Who will do it? He will do it. You see, God is working for us, on us, to make us more fruitful. So don't give up on God when things aren't working out your way. Remain in relationship with our eyes set on eternity and eternal fruit. I love this verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. He's renewing us day by day. The challenge is to remain, remain, remain. Say that to your neighbor, remain. And finally, the last truth is that he is faithful to us. John 15, 4, remain in me as I remain in you. I choose to remain in this relationship because it's Jesus at the other side of it. We are invited into a relationship with him, a partnership where we, we're not the only ones who choose to remain, but Jesus is right there beside us saying, hey, I will choose to remain in you as well. We're not choosing to remain in a religion, putting our hope into traditions, but into God. And Jesus, it's a, a relationship with Jesus who is not requiring anything from us that he isn't already giving. He's faithful to us. And some of us here have issues with commitment. Maybe you put your faith in someone, something, and they mistreated you. Maybe your parents left you or they, your, what your father left your family, whatever it may be. Maybe you, you trusted a friend and they're no longer in your life. And you say, I'm never going to trust in a relationship again. I'm going to get hurt again. I'm going to get burned again. But I want to tell you that there's no one who can be as faithful to you as Jesus is to you. Amen. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is always with you. Everything in your life has potential to change. People will change. Situations will change. Your life will change. But Jesus will never change. 
He's faithful. Remaining in him is the best choice we can make. He's the best partner in a relationship. He's earned our faithfulness. If some of you today are wavering in your commitment, he's earned your commitment. He's proven to be worthy. There is no one that loves you like him. His promises is that he'll love you with the same love that the father loves him. It says that in John 15, 9, as the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Perfect love. Now remain in my love. See, remaining in God's love, it's not a dry, desolate place. It's not a place where we're just obeying and enduring, obey and endure. But it's a place full of love, a place full of life. It's a place full of perfect love that chooses you, pursues you. I love this verse. Let's turn to Romans 8, 38 to 39. For I am convinced... That neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, we're in a relationship putting our trust in someone who always comes through, who fulfills every word that he has spoken in your life, every promise. In Psalms 119, it says this, your word Lord is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You establish the earth and it endures. We're remaining in Jesus, who's close to the brokenhearted, who, who renews us in the waiting, who lifts us up when we can't lift ourselves up. It says it in Isaiah 40, 31, but those who hope in the Lord renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run, not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Church, if there's anything in life to be faithful to, to remain in, let it be Jesus Christ, who has time and time again has been found faithful and loving to us. Let us be giving everything to the one who gives everything to us. And if there's anything that you get from this message today, any truth that you get, let it be the person of Jesus, who he is, be the one that keeps you here, that keeps you drawing back to him, that keeps you faithful. Let him be enough, who he is, be enough for you to remain in him. That's what we're talking about today, church, remaining in Jesus, the true vine. The giver of life. Remain, remain, remain. And as I close, I want to say there's nothing in life that can substitute Jesus for you. We're made to remain in him. He's the true vine. He's the only source. And you will be searching forever if you're trying to fill the void that only Jesus can fill. And if you don't know him, and you're hearing about him for the first time today. And you're saying, I want that Jesus in my life. I've been searching. And, and, and I found Jesus. And you want him into your life. I'm inviting you to offer your life to him, to commit to him, to invite him in your life today. All we need to do is to acknowledge we're sinners, to repent, to come to him. So if you're that person, I want to encourage you today. We're going to do have a moment where we could have a call to salvation. And if you're that person today, I want to tell you, no one will love you like Jesus. No one will give everything to you like Jesus does. No one will stay faithful to you as Jesus does. So accept him today. So with every eye, every eye and head, eye closed and head bowed. On the count of three, I'm going to ask, if you want to commit your, your life to Christ today, you want to invite the true vine into your life, that you would raise your hand and decide today, with every eye closed, head bowed, on the count of three. One, two, three. Thank you for that hand. Thank you. So you can open our eyes. I want to lead us all in a, a commitment prayer. If you raise your hand, I want you to repeat after me this prayer. And this is only the start of your walk with God, accepting him in your life. 
After this, the challenge is to remain in him. And we want to, we'll talk about how we can do that together. But with every eye closed, let's pray this. Repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. I believe that you died on the cross, was buried, and in three days rose again, that I may be free from sin. Lord Jesus, I accept you to be my Lord and Savior. Jesus, help me walk out a life with you. Lord Jesus, help me remain in you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Let's just give God glory for it. If you committed your life to Christ, it's only the beginning. The great news is that we have family around us who will help you walk this out together. If you're online and you've dedicated to Christ, make sure that you fill out our Connect card and click that you've dedicated your life to Christ. And someone will be in contact with you who can help you walk through this. You're not alone in this. And we're all rejoicing that you've made that decision today. I also want to do a second prayer for all of us. Maybe you're in that season of pruning. Maybe you're in that season of hardship. Maybe you're in a season where you're in and out of relationship with Jesus, kind of dabbling in other things. Your commitment is off and you're searching in other areas. I want to encourage you today to decide to be faithful. Decide to remain. Fight to actively be here. We're just going to pray a prayer of, of recommitment and pray that the Lord would strengthen us as we remain in him. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you, you love us so much. We thank you, God, that you're the true source. And we intentionally choose to connect to you today. We, God, ask you to help us be faithful to you. Help us to remain in you. Help us to abide in you, God. Lord, may we be found faithful to you. So God, help us, Lord, through all the distractions, through all the busyness, to put our priority on you. God, we want to bear good fruit. Lord, I pray for the people who are in the hard seasons of life right now, the pruning seasons, that you would encourage them, that, Lord, that you are doing something in them, for them, that, Lord, they would experience your goodness. Lord Jesus, so just be present in all these situations. God, we love you. We bless you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Thank you all. I hope you're blessed. Let's all just stand as we receive the benediction today and we go from this place. Let's lift our hands to the heavens. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace. May he cause you to walk under an open heaven. May he open doors of opportunity for you that you can enter in and be victorious for God. May he continue to fill you with his love grace, peace, and the power of his Holy Spirit throughout this week and until he comes through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen and amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.